1928 and 1929, there were a series of baffling and completely unexpected deaths in the South London borough of Croydon, involving two interconnected families. It concerns the cases of three mysterious murders that take place within a short space of time, crimes which were sensational and which remain unsolved to this day. This is Finch's Murders and the Croydon Poisoner. All families have their financial ups and downs, and the Sydney family were no different. Their grandfather, Thomas Sydney, had been Lord Mayor of London from 1953 to 1954. They were reasonably prosperous due to inheritances from their grandfather. But as in all families, there are exceptions. The first was Thomas Sydney who, after serving in the army, before coming some kind of entertainer, was consequently chronically short of funds. He had acquired an American wife whilst on tour, who was threatening to return to the States with their children. The second was the daughter of the Sydney family called Grace, who was beautiful, charming, and had the right social connections. Instead, she married in 1911 a former colonial officer called Edmund Duff, who had been High Commissioner in northern Nigeria, where he contracted malaria and blackwater fever. He was 17 years her senior. The Sydney family felt she had married beneath her station. Edmund had returned to England in 1919 and resumed his career in the colonial office. In 1924, he was dismissed from the civil service for some unknown reason and had to take a lowly clerical job in a paper factory. The Duffs could have been reasonably comfortable as Grace had received a decent legacy from her father. But Edmund was hopeless with money but still wanted to maintain his extravagant lifestyle. He fancied himself as an expert in finance but kept being stung by get-rich-quick schemes. Again, they were short of funds, and he was pestering Grace to cash in one of her last two insurance policies for his next plan. He was known to be a brute and very demanding. He had set up two life insurance policies in the name of Grace, and persuaded her to cash in one of them for £5,000, which he blew. He wanted to cash in the other policy, which could leave the family destitute and dependent on his mother-in-law and sister-in-law for financial help. Grace could be described not only as a bit of an actress, but also a complete flirt, which could become dangerous, as she was rumoured to be having an affair with her GP, Dr. Alwell. He was wealthy and a bachelor. The matriarch of the family was Violet Sidney, who shared the house with her 40-year-old spinster daughter, Vera. Violet dominated the lives of Thomas and Vera, but less so Grace. To add to this scene of happy families, Edmund and Thomas despised each other. With mounting debts, Grace took the decision that they needed to downsize, and they moved to a smaller house in South Park Hill in Croydon before making another move after her husband's death to 29 Birdhurst Rise, to be closer to Grace's mother and unmarried sister. The Duffs took in a lady of some financial means, Miss Anna Kelvy, as a paying guest. Kelvy died suddenly and unexpectedly in January 1927, leaving gifts of £25, to each of Grace's two children. Did Grace decide a year later that Edmund's profligacy with money was another problem that she needed to resolve? On the 26th of April 1928, Edmund, seemingly in excellent health, returned home to Croydon from a fishing trip with a colonial friend, 
complaining of nausea and leg cramps. He remarked that the last time he felt this bad was when he received his inoculation for bubonic plague in India. At dinner, he could eat some chicken and potatoes, but drank some beer from a stoppered bottle. He was the only one in the household who drank beer, and did notice that the seal had been broken. He was assured that everything was in order. Later that night, Dr. Elwell, the family doctor, was called and recommended aspirin, quinine and bed rest. Grace noted that her husband's face, which was red and flushed, had turned pallid. That night, he was plagued with acute pain, diarrhoea and was shivering. The next day, Grace rang the surgery. As Dr. Elwell was doing his rounds, his partner, Dr. Binning, visited the house. He was later joined by his colleague. That night, on the 1st of April 1928, Edmund died. The doctors could not give the cause of death and were not prepared to issue a death certificate at the time. As a consequence, the local coroner was called and after the post-mortem, Edmund's internal organs were sent to medical experts for analysis. They noted that his body contained some quinine and mercury in medical quantities. The coroner, Dr. Bonte, stated that the cause of death was chronic myocarditis, or degeneration of the heart. It was surmised that it resulted from eating freshwater fish on his holiday, sunstroke, or the result of some dreadful disease caught in the tropics. At the inquest into her husband's death, held on May the 2nd, Grace took the stand to recount events leading to her husband's death. She was tearful and hesitant, and said nothing which incriminated her. He was buried in Queen's Road Cemetery, and after paying the funeral bills, there was nothing left in his estate. But the two life insurance policies taken out on him would help the family finances enormously. In today's values, they equated to about £81,500. Up the road in Croydon, at 29 Birdhurst Drive, lived Edmund's mother-in-law, the widowed Violet Sidney. The other occupants of the house were sister-in-law Vera Sidney and the live-in cook, Kathleen Noakes. Vera, like many women of her generation, was what was termed at the time as a forgotten woman and like many, did not see their men and potential husbands come home from the slaughter of the First World War. Unlike her siblings, she was comfortably well off from the inheritance of her grandfather. Generally, she was in robust health and spent endless hours playing golf. Her other great passions were bridge and her 7.5 horsepower Citroen motor car. But like many women in her position, she was under the thumb of her mother. January 1929 was a particularly cold month, and Vera, like many of her contemporaries, was feeling under the weather. But the key date is the evening of the 11th of February. Dinner consisted of soup, fish, fried potatoes, pudding and fruit. The soup was prepared by Mrs. Noakes and consisted of carrots, turnips, onions, some tap water and Symington's brand soup powder. At dinner it was only Vera who consumed the soup as her mother never touched it. Mrs. Noakes, who normally did not have soup, tried some to offset a bout of flu. She gave the remainder to the cat. That night... Vera, Mrs. Noakes, and Bingo the cat were violently ill. The next day Vera felt better and arranged to go to her garage to start up the car. The engine had frozen overnight and she needed a hand to finally get it going. Aunt Gwendolyn, Mrs. Sidney's sister-in-law, was visiting London from Newcastle 
and invited herself to lunch on the 14th of February. Grace brought her from the station, but did not partake of lunch herself, but invited the aunt and her sister to tea later that day. The lunch party consisted of Violet and Vera together with Aunt Gwendolyn. The aunt ate some soup, but not in the quantity of Vera. Some time later, the aunt and the niece became ill, and tea was postponed as Grace accompanied her aunt back to the station. Vera's condition got worse, and Dr. Elwell and Dr. Binning intended her during the night. At one point, an expert on gastric flu was called in, but merely announced she was suffering from flu. On the 15th of February, she died, and Dr. Elwell was able to issue a death certificate which said that the cause of death was gastric flu, aggravated by vigorous exercise when starting up the car in bitterly cold weather. Ten months after Edmund's death, his sister-in-law had died in similar circumstances. Given the loss of her daughter, it is unsurprising that Mrs. Sidney would become depressed, and matters were not helped because she also had a heavy cold. Eventually she recovered, and the family doctor, Dr. Elwell, gave us some philosan tablets and a tonic known as metatone. After Vera's death, she also started exhibiting the same symptoms. She was telling people that she thought she was being poisoned, but nobody intervened to save her. Violet Sidney took her medicines as prescribed, but on the last occasion, she remarked that it tasted odd in some way. Eighteen days after the death of her daughter, Violet was also deceased. The doctors could not agree on the actual cause of death, and the matter was handed over to the local coroner. It was assumed at the time that it may have been caused by food poisoning. A short time afterwards, a Home Office pathologist from Guy's Hospital, Dr. Rifle, discovered arsenic in the woman's organs during the post-mortem. There would later be a dramatic scene at Queen's Road Cemetery on the evenings of the 21st and 22nd of March as the corpses of Violet and Vera were exhumed and taken away for forensic examination. Unfortunately, the medical experts were slapdash in their approach. Dr. Reifel used all the contents from a medicine bottle for his research instead of leaving half of it for further investigation. The pathologist, Dr. Bronte, is thought to have taken the wrong organs, and therefore did not spot the signs of arsenic poisoning in the case of Edmund Duff. Concerning the mother, Dr. Reifel was able to prove that Mrs. Sidney's hair and nails contained no traces of arsenic, and that death occurred within 12 hours of digesting the medicine she had taken. The police were able to track down tins of poisonous weed killer in both the house of Mrs. Sidney and that of Edmund Duff, but arsenic was present everywhere in those days, from wallpaper to cosmetics. It has one major flaw, as it not only preserves wood, but also corpses, and will remain in the body, hence the well-preserved status of the bodies of Vera and Edmund, whose body had been exhumed on the 1st of May. The inquests into the three deaths did not occur at once, but over three periods in 1929, with three different juries presided over by Dr. Jackson. So who had access to both the arsenic and the households? There was the brother, Thomas, and his sister, Grace. But there was one other, a jobbing gardener called Lane, who tended their gardens at various times. He was old, extremely deaf, and made an appalling witness. The suspicion now rested on the remaining siblings. The inquest amounted to 26 sittings, 
and Thomas gave evidence at twelve of them, whilst Grace only had to endure eight. Thomas was a shocking witness, being described by one writer as careless, truculent and obstreperous, whilst Grace was seen as circumspect and conciliatory. But what about Mrs Noakes? She certainly ate the soup and was sick that night. It would appear that an odd way to kill someone, especially as she was said to be fond of the mother. Grace was known to be a bit of a flirt, and there were rumours in and around Croydon that her relationship with the family GP, Dr Elwell, was not entirely professional. The medical council takes a stern view of an undue relationship between a medical man and his patient. Over the years, the finger of suspicion was pointed at one family member after another. A minority have accused Thomas. He certainly did not like Edmund, but would he have the means of getting into the latter's house undisturbed and poisoning him? Interestingly, Mrs Noakes initially swore that on the day of the death of Violet, she saw Thomas in the house, but under cross-examination, she could not definitely state she actually saw him. Edmund's wife, Grace, was at one stage the prime suspect, as it was suggested she got rid of her husband because she was having an affair. It was often said that after she got away with Edmund's murder, she was thought to have poisoned sister Vera and Violet for financial gain. A subsequent additional inquest ruled that at least two of the relatives had been murdered after they had been poisoned with arsenic, but nobody was ever charged. So what happened to this family over the following years? Thomas returned to America and eventually abandoned the rather precarious world of entertainment and set up a successful antiques business in New Orleans. Grace moved to the South Coast and formed some kind of relationship with a man she had met. He left all of his estate to her on his death in 1970. Grace died in 1973, aged 87, and possibly took the secrets of the death with her to the grave. (laughs) 